camera is rolling. Um, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone, to the first Friday lecture for the month of November. Today's speaker is David Shiner, and David's title is From Muthos to Logos. This first Friday lecture <clears throat> is supported by the Anastopolo Lecture Series Fund in memory of basic program instructor George Anastopolo. Please note that this presentation is being recorded and it will be available on the Graham School YouTube channel uh, in the coming week if you want to watch it later. Also, please be aware that you will not be able to unmute your microphones during the presentation as a courtesy to our speaker. You will be able to ask questions, however, by typing them into the chat box. You can do so at any time during the lecture. Questions that you type in the chat box, I will keep track of, and then I will pose them to David at the end of the lecture during our question and answer period. During the presentation itself, as I say, all will be muted except for our speaker. David and I will be able to see your video, but we won't be able to hear you. So if you choose to leave your video on or to turn it off, it is at your discretion. David's video will be spotlighted for the most part during the presentation. Consequently, the best way to view the lecture is to select speaker view instead of gallery view. Today's lecture is being sponsored by the basic program of liberal education for adults at the University of Chicago's Graham School. My name is Kendall Sharp, and I am the Cyril O'Hool Chair of the BASIC program. Before I properly introduce our speaker, I'd like to say a few words about the BASIC program, the Graham School, and our upcoming courses and events. You can find links to more information in the chat box. The BASIC program is a four-year non-credit certificate program at the University of Chicago's Graham School of Continuing Studies. Graham offers an array of programs besides the BASIC program, since 1946, the BASIC program has offered its students a rigorous liberal arts curriculum based on the principle of direct engagement with original thinkers in their original texts. Through focused discussion and close reading, our classes provide direct encounters with some of the great works of classical and Western culture in a dedicated community of adult learners led by experienced University of Chicago educated instructors Registration for winter quarter 2024 courses is now open. Dates are also set for spring break in Greece and for the fortnight in Oxford travel study programs for 2024, so save the dates. Our next First Friday lecture will happen on December 1, when our speaker will be, I may humbly report, myself. My title will be Starting with Tragedy, Why the Basic Program Begins with Ancient Greek Drama and Philosophy. As I mentioned before, this presentation is being recorded. The recording will become available on our YouTube channel early next week. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. David Shiner is Professor Emeritus at Shimer College, now the Shimer Great Book School at North Central College, where he taught for 40 years and served several terms as Dean of the college. At Shimer, Professor Shiner taught all 16 required courses on subjects as distinct as literature, chemistry, <laughs> psychology, and politics. He has also taught at other colleges as well as at Great Discourses, <clears throat> an online provider of high quality non-credit courses. He has written on the Dialogues of Plato, the philosophy of the French Enlightenment, game theory, economics, and paradox. David's non-academic activities include chess, acting, musical performance, and sports. David holds a PhD in philosophy from Pacific Miramar University. He has an interest in classics, especially classical philosophy. Now it is my pleasure to turn things over to David. David? Well, thanks very much, Kendall, and thanks to everybody for being here. Um, hope we'll, uh, we'll make it worth your while today we talk about the transition from Muthos to Logos. Let me uh, get the screen shared here. Okay, so from Muthos to Logos, I'm going to start in a very kind of informal way by considering what we mean by the word myth, not traditionally, but in common parlance, common usage. We regularly come across in, in sentences like, it's a myth that chocolate is bad for your health. 
right? Something like that. In a case like this, it's clear that the speaker or writer is trying to convey that the statement that's being referred to as a myth is false. Right? In other words, this is kind of our conception of the relationship between myth and fact these days. But that doesn't completely account for what's being implied in the statement. After all, a lie is also a false statement, but we don't usually use myth and lie in the same sense. For example, if a witness in a court case lies under oath, we wouldn't ordinarily say that they told a myth on the witness stand. And that's because we rarely, if ever, use the word myth to refer to a belief held by only a single person. Myth involves beliefs that are held by a group rather than an individual. So if we were to try to come up with a little bit better definition of the word myth in contemporary usage, we might say it's a statement or set of statements that are fairly widely believed to be true or believed to be true by some group, but are in fact false. And if indeed we remove the false qualification from that definition, we get closer to a more historically accurate one. Because the original ancient myths, and that's what I'm going to largely start talking about today, were those that were the province of a group rather than an individual. But contrary to the contemporary sense, they were those that that group regarded as being unquestionably true. And there's still more to it than that. Even if the statement that chocolate is bad for your health was proven to be true, the fact that it's fairly widely believed wouldn't be sufficient for it to qualify as a myth as it was classically understood. And that's in part because no single statement can be a myth in that sense. Mythology is about stories rather than statements. The myths you're most likely to be familiar with, I would think in this group, are probably those of Homer, as presented in the epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. You might also have come across the theogony of Homer's near contemporary Hesiod, who recounted the story of the creation of the universe and its aftermath as well as the genesis and roles of many of the major Greek gods and goddesses. I'll be talking more about the works of Homer and Hesiod later on. For now though, I just wanna mention that those works represent a rather late stage in the development of myth in classical antiquity. It was a stage that I'm gonna be arguing today was already signaling the transition from muthos to logos, or as we might say more loosely, from mythology and myth mythological consciousness to philosophy and the birth of critical thinking. Muthos, the Greek word of the, the Greek root of the word mythology, means more or less story of the people. The word muthos historically referred to accounts that were believed to be true by the people for whom they served as foundational. They were regarded, as I mentioned, but, a little earlier as indisputable truths. They weren't statements to be subjected to critical analysis and they were handed down as the truths of the origin. The word logos literally means something like I say, although like muthos, it can denote a story. But unlike muthos, logos came to mean that which could be argued about and subjected to rational demonstration. And it, logos can mean a lot of other things, right? In the Gospel of John and the Christian scriptures, uh, it, in the beginning was the, was the logos, uh, that we would not consider the, you know, something subject to rational demonstration. But for here, we're going to be talking about logos in this sense of um, its uh, orientation as referring to something like philosophy, uh, rationality, logic. As Lagos gained cultural currency over time, it competed with increasing success with Muthos for the mantle of truth. The eventual result was the decline of Muthos, ultimately leading to the contemporary view of myth that we just talked about as a type of falsehood, or at the most, a throwback to superstitious pre-rational human culture. That transition, particularly with how it played out in ancient Greece, is going to be the main focus of my talk today. So what is muthos? Let's take a little bit more of a definition of comprehensive classical myths. They typically did the following things among others, but these three are what I'm gonna call 
characteristics of paradigmatic myths. I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. So what did they do? They invoked supernatural beings and events. They accounted for natural and or social phenomena. And they testified as to the origins of the universe and or of the group for whom the myth was foundational. Could be the origin of the universe, could be the, or the origin of the group uh, that believed the myth. If you're familiar with Homer's epics, you'll see that they don't really fulfill all these criteria. Criterion one, yes, lots of supernatural beings and events. Criteria two, they account for some natural or social phenomena, but kind of restricted. And as far as the origins of the universe or the group for whom the myth was foundational, not really at all. So for the purposes of le this lecture, I'm going to be referring to myths that do fulfill all of these as paradigmatic myths. And those are uh, like the, the ancient, er <clears throat> sorry, it's the various ancient myths of the creation of the universe. And most importantly, these are ones that are usually developed first in oral traditions, not written ones. But the myths to which we have access, the ancient myths certainly are written, so we'll need to start with those. A well-known example of a paradigmatic creation myth is it, the ancient Babylonian epic poem, the Enuma Elish. Enuma Elish, which literally means went on high or went above, is thought to have been written well over three millennia ago, possibly as much as three and a half millennia ago. So it's about a thousand years before the time of uh, Socrates and Plato and so forth. The Enuma Elish begins by characterizing the universe as a watery chaos with no sky or land, not significantly different from the description of the universe at the beginning of the book of Genesis in the Hebrew scriptures. In Genesis, by the way, everything begins with water. There's no dry land until the second day of the creation of the universe. You might want to look at um, book one uh, verses, sorry, chapter one ver verses uh, one through 10 of Genesis to confirm that. And in fact, the Enuma Elish has come to be regarded by many scholars as the inspiration for the Hebrew scribes who created the text of Genesis. But after that, the similarities end and there are many more differences. In the Enuma Elish, Babylonian creation story, the sea is personified by the goddess Tiamat. Tiamat mingles with other waters, which are identified as the god Apsu. The union of Ap Tiamat and Apsu produces the other gods. After a complex series of events, a younger god named Marduk kills Tiamat and cuts her body in two, using one half of it to create the earth and the other half to create heaven. As a result of these actions, Marduk becomes Lord of the gods of heaven and earth. Marduk is the central figure. Here, he's slaying a dragon, and this has also fairly major importance in the Enuma Elish, but that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're, um, what we're talking about here. So the remainder of the Enuma Elish, the last part, deals summarily with Marduk's organization of the cosmos, his creation of human beings, and his assigning of the gods to their various cosmic offices and tasks. The Enuma Elish was reenacted every year during an ancient Babylonian New Year's festival known as Akitu. It took place every spring, and it marked the annual flooding of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers which were needed for a successful growing season. The festival also celebrated the ritual renewal of the foundation of the world as disclosed in the Enuma Elish, during which the social order was readjusted for the coming year. As part of this readjustment, the Babylonian gods assembled to establish destinies for humankind as they saw fit. The Akitu festival marked a new beginning for the Babylonian people, a beginning each year based on their origin myth. As the um, University of Chicago, late University of Chicago uh, historian of religion, Dr. Marcea Iliada once put it, to know the myths is to learn the secret of the origins of things. And performing the myth that contained that secret in a festival like Akitu allowed the society to appropriately celebrate each new beginning. Reenacting a myth meant that those who participated in it were seized by the power of the sacred atmosphere in which the mythic events took place. This was not a play reading. Um, so 
The annual performance of the Enuma Elish in the Akidu festival was a major social event. It involved the whole of Babylonian society. But the faithful recounting of myths could also be matters of importance for individuals and families and for smaller groups. This could also involve, this could involve myths of core cultural origins rather than of creation itself. An example is the origin myth of the Osage Indians. Here's how it begins. The Osages came from the sky, from among and of the stars. In the upper worlds, the Osages existed first as spirit beings, and in their humility, called themselves the little ones. The little ones decided that they should go down to earth to become a people. After receiving help and advice from four gods, the god of day, night, male star, and female star, the little ones asked Honga Huiton, the immature golden eagle, to lead them below to become a people. Honga Huiton led the little ones down through the four divisions of heaven and so forth. So the myth goes on to tell what happened when the little ones reached the earth and how they eventually came to form a human community. It explained natural and social phenomena as is typical of paradigmatic myths. And as with the ancient Babylonians, reciting the myth from memory was important for the Osage, although it took place somewhat differently. Dr. Mircea Eliade described it this way. When a child is being born among the Osages, a man who has talked with the gods is summoned. When he reaches the new mother's house, he recites the creation story to the newborn infant. Not until this has been done is the baby given the breast. Later, when the baby wants to drink water, the same man, or sometimes another, is called in again. Once again, he cites the creation, ending with the origin of water. When the child is old enough to take solid food, the man who has talked with the gods comes once more and again recites the creation, this time also reciting the origins of grains and other foods. The object of this recapitulation is to introduce the newborn child ritually into the sacramental reality of the world and culture, and thus to validate their new existence by announcing that it conforms to the mythical paradigms. The myths of the ancient Babylonians and the more recent Osages are examples of paradigmatic myths, ones that fulfill all the criteria set forth earlier. As a reminder, they invoke supernatural beings and events, they account for natural and or social phenomena, and they testify as to the origins of the universe and or of the group for whom the myth was foundational. Not all of the stories we refer to as myths do all of that. As I mentioned, the myths of, of Homer don't. They do some, but not all. But all of those stories, all of those myths do fulfill what the famed mythologist Joseph Campbell referred to as the basic theme of mythology, which is that the visible world is supported and sustained by an invisible world. This invisible world gives meaning to the visible world and especially to human life. In paradigmatic myths, such as the ones I've discussed so far of the Babylonians and the Osages, and there are many others that can be mentioned. Questions of causation are rarely, if ever, directly addressed. Mythic accounts help tell how things came to be, but they don't directly state why they did. Mythographers explain this by saying that in myths, the why is embedded in the how, which is to say that the myths indirectly point to explanations. Those explanations are based primarily on the sequence of events as rendered in the myth, but this causal connection is rarely stated explicitly. The type of causation that's implied in mythic modes of explanation is also very different from our modern accounts. Our typical modes of explanation, especially for large scale events, are often generalized. And what I mean by that is they might refer to the natural world, maybe things like Newton's laws of motion or Darwin's laws of biological inheritance, or in the human realm, studies of social groups or political parties or ethnicities. So for example, for us, if the Tigris and Euphrates rivers don't rise early one spring, we might account for that as being caused by a lack of rainfall in the area due to unfavorable weather conditions. And then we could trace that back uh, further. <clears throat> 
And that sort of explanation is common for us, but it's foreign to mythic consciousness. And that was because in the words of the cultural anthropologists Henri and Henriette Frankfurt, this is what mythic consciousness is about. The world appears to primitive man, they used those terms in those days, this is around 1950, neither inanimate nor empty, but redundant with life. And life has individuality in man, in beast, in plant, and in every phenomenon which confronts man. The thunderclap, the sudden shadow, the eerie and unknown clearing in the wood, the stone which suddenly hurts him when he stumbles while on a hunting trip." Unquote. So for the ancient Babylonians, the people of the Enuma Elish, the fact that the rivers didn't rise would have meant that they refused to rise, which in turn would have meant that the river gods or the rivers themselves didn't accept the remembrance events that had been reenacted at that year's Akidu festival. For the ancients, that refusal was a personal and emotional matter, right? Something like the river gods are angry and it called for some action on their part in response. This wasn't because the ancients had no means for making more generalized correlations between events. For example, in ancient Egypt, annual records of the heights of the Nile were kept from the earliest known historical times. So the Egyptians knew, or at least could have known, when the river was likely to rise and to what extent. However, despite this, or in complementing it, or we don't really know, Pharaoh made gifts to the Nile every year about the time it was due to rise. And those gifts were apparently the same, regardless of what, uh, how things looked in terms of uh, previous circumstances and what they could have told the Egyptians. We read about other types of sacrifice to placate angry gods and goddesses, of course, in the works of Homer, as well as in writers from a later time period. Just last week, I read an account of an artist's reconstruction. You might've seen this in the news. It was of a teenage Inca girl who was sacrificed to the gods some 600 years ago during an Inca ritual called Capachoca. This ritual involved the sacrifice of children, of Inca children to the gods in response to natural disasters, such as volcanic eruptions. The gods must be angry, they need to be placated. Archeologists generally believe that these children's communities regarded the children's selection for sacrifice to the gods as an honor. Anyway, the sacrifice was um, the result of a mythical view of the universe as teeming with life and fully intentional. And I think I had skipped this. This was the Nile, not terribly important um, uh, slide, but uh, do want to kind of keep things moving here. So the early 20th century philosopher, Dr. Ernst Kassirer, whom we'll be count encountering again later this afternoon, time permitting, wrote about it this way. The world of myth was a dramatical world, a world of actions, of forces, of conflicting powers. In every phenomenon of nature, it sees the collision of these powers. And the transformation of that view, the view I've just kind of uh, synopsized to the type of generalization, generalized explanation that succeeded it, and which continues to do so to this day will be the subject of uh, most of the rest of my talk. Historically, the transition from Muthos to Lagos is bound up with the passage from an oral tradition to a written one. Since we don't have direct access to preliterate forms of culture from times long before our own, we have to depend on a medium, that is writing, that differs significantly from the one that produced and disseminated the original myth. This is very important because a written myth, even one that's been faithfully recorded, perhaps as in the works of Homer and Hesiod, is almost always a modification of a pre-existing text, whether that text was originally written or spoken. And in most, if not all cases of paradigmatic myth, it was la the latter was spoken. In the words of, again, Dr. Mercedes Iliada, the classic Greek myths already represent the triumph of the literary work over religious belief. By the classic, he means the ones we're talking about, Homeric myths, Hesiodic myths, the kind of things you would read in Edith Hamilton or Bullfinch's mythology. Not a single Greek myth has come down to us in its cult context. Um, we know the myths as literary and artistic documents, not as sources or expressions 
of a religious experience bound up with the right. To give you a somewhat loosely um, related, re more recent example of why the difference between this sort of oral and body moving performance and a written text that we hear and read is so important. I'll cite a statement by the great dancer Isadora Duncan. Once after a performance, Duncan was asked by an audience member what one of her dances meant. And Duncan replied, if I could tell you that, I wouldn't have had to dance it. So when we consider the importance to mythically oriented people, such as the ancient Babylonians, of performing their myth, while being carried away by the spirit in which the events recounted in it were thought to have taken place, we realize that the difference between Muthos and Lagos is as great or greater than between, say, Homer's Odyssey and Plato's Republic. And once we start to realize this, we might begin to become aware that the written versions of myth contain the seeds of their eventual demise. The oldest known written versions of ancient Greek myths are those of Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey and Hesiod, the author of Theogony, as I mentioned earlier. And when I speak about Homer, I'm gonna leave aside this issue of whether he just recited these, whether there was one Homer or many, whether he wrote this down, we're gonna bracket all that and that's not gonna be part of our discussion for today. When I refer to Homer's Iliad or the Homeric epics, um, that's, uh, that's what, how we're going to, um, to work with them for today. And, discuss those other uh, timely issues at another time. So Homer and Hesiod, they're thought to have flourished in or around the late eighth century BC. Homer was probably slightly the earlier of the two. So Homer may be around 725 BC, Hesiod closer to 700, something like that. Some 300 years later, the historian Herodotus, who was a contemporary of Socrates, wrote that quote, Homer and Hesiod were the first to compose theogonies and give the gods their epithets and to allot to them their several offices and occupations and describe their forms. As far as we're aware, some 2,500 year, years later, Herodotus was correct about that. But composing theogonies, that is celestial origin stories, doesn't make Homer and Hethia the first purveyors of myth, although it might make them the first to have been known to have written them down. The myths themselves undoubtedly date from a much earlier period. The epic poems of Homer in the written form in which we've received them contain many of the trappings of myth as developed in the preceding millennia. Some of these like the invocation of supernatural beings and events are obvious. They're throughout the Iliad and the Odyssey. Others are less so. In Homeric poetry to tell a muthos, again, the definition of muthos, the story of the people, is to perform it from memory. As in the paradigmatic myths I mentioned earlier, but without the festival uh, and uh, celebratory social organization aspects. And this is represented in several places in the Homeric corpus. Early in the Iliad, for example, the old hero Nestor re recalls the story of a battle between the centaurs and the Lapiths. And he calls that story a muthos, even though the word is never translated as myth by Homer's translators. In telling this muthos, Nestor is recalling an event in which he himself participated. So it might seem that this is a big departure in the way that muthos is thought of compared to the uh, paradigmatic myths of the Babylonians and the Osage Indians. But just as recounting or reenacting a muthos doesn't require having been present in the Enuma Elish or the others, the presentation of a muthos in Homeric poetry doesn't necessarily involve recalling a personal experience either. It did for Nestor, but another example in book nine, another venerable hero, Phoenix, tells a story for the purpose of trying to persuade Achilles to soften his rage and return to the battlefield. Phoenix introduces this story by saying this, and this is during a very, very long passage that Phoenix is speaking to Achilles in book nine. So it was in the old days too. So we've heard in the famous deeds of fighting men, of heroes, when seething anger would overcome the great ones. Still, you could bring them round with gifts and winning words. There's an old story, there's an old muthos, I remember, an ancient exploit, nothing recent, but this is how it went. The story that follows this passage tells how, how the warrior Meleager 
overcame his rage and returned to the battlefield to save his people, the Aetolians, as Phoenix is vainly encouraging Achilles to do for his fellow Achaeans. This sort of passage indicates that a wise personage, a Nestor or a Phoenix, an older man, in Homer's works can recall a muthos that they did not personally experience, much as the Babylonians and Osages did. So in these ways and lots of others, the core features of the Iliad and the Odyssey are mythic, and I don't mean to say anything to the contrary, but the texts of both works point to some differences from paradigmatic myth. We'll start with the beginning of the Iliad, lines one through 10. It's Fagel's translation again. Rage, goddess, sing the rage of Peleus' son Achilles, murderous, doomed, that cost the Achaeans countless losses, hurling down to the house of death so many sturdy souls, great fighters' souls, but made their birds carry in feasts for the dogs and birds, and the will of Zeus was moving toward its end. Begin, Muse, when the two first broke and clashed, Agamemnon, Lord of Men, and the brilliant Achilles. What god drove them to fight with such a fury? Apollo, the son of Zeus and Leto. So, after establishing in the first eight lines that the poem is about Achilles' rage, the deaths of the Achaeans, the will of Zeus, and the quarrel between Achilles and Agamemnon, Homer asks a question. What god drove him to fight with such a fury? Of course, the question immediately gets answered. But it's not the answer that interests us here, but rather the fact that Homer poses a question. A question that isn't asked by one of the protagonists itself, that could be done in ancient myth, but by the poet, as if the answer was in suspension, if only meant momentarily. This is unthinkable in paradigmatic myths, precisely because the facts are so certain, or quote facts, if you prefer, that no question can even be asked within the mythic framework. Questioning, even briefly or rhetorically, implies possible doubt as to the answer. It therefore presages the beginning of critical thinking, although distantly, and thus provides unwitting preparation for the transition from Muthos to Logos. Also significant here is the fact that Homer responds to the question he's asked in line nine by in saying in line 10, here is the account of causation. Sorry, I'm clicking a little too quickly here. And in this case, the god Apollo. These kinds of accounts of causation occur throughout the Iliad and the Odyssey. Rather than being given a mere sequence of events, as in the paradigmatic versions of myth discussed earlier, we are actually told the why of each event. Right? Who does it and why they do it is a, a staple of the Homeric mode of myth speaking, which involves uh, explicit explanation. Of course, many of these causal accounts are supernatural rather than natural, which is to say that the mythic elements are, of course, still vitally important in the Homeric works. But the fact that the question of causation is explicitly raised at all implicitly suggests the possibility that other accounts of causation might be put forth. And historically, that, of course, is exactly what's going to happen. There's another point about the gods and goddesses in Homer's works that will become important later on in this talk, which is that they're often divided among themselves. This is, of course, well known to, to readers of the Iliad. These gods and goddesses favor different individuals and cities. They get into quarrels with each other. They play tricks and so on. Human beings in these epics, therefore, worship the gods not because they're highly ethical or because they're extremely wise, although maybe you could make a case that Zeus is pretty wise, but generally the issue isn't that, it's that they're powerful. This aspect of the Homeric epics reflects pre-existing mythic modes very well. But as we shall see, it's gonna become problematic when Muthos meets Logos. Hesiod also unintentionally presages the pending transition from Muthos to Logos, although in a different way. In the Theogony, Hesiod offers a myth that describes the origins of the universe. Those origins include an account of the king of the gods, Zeus, on the basis of earlier battles for ascendancy that loosely parallel the myth of the rise to eternal rulership of Marduk among the Babylonians, as well as the creation myths of the Egyptians and other cultures. But as with Homer's epics, 
A study of Hesiod's works also reveals significant differences from paradigmatic myth. After beginning the theogony with a long self-referential introduction, itself a form unknown in earlier myths and not utilized even by Homer, in fact, Aristotle later on compliments Homer for not inserting himself into his poetry, Hesiod begins his account of the origins of the universe as follows. First chaos came to be, but next wide bosomed earth. The ever sure foundations of all the deathless ones who hold the peaks of snowy Olympus and dim abyss in the depth of the wide path earth and love. And again, I'm, I'm reading the English versions, but this is what the words mean. Fairest among the deathless gods who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind and wide counsel of all gods and all men within them. From chaos came forth shadow and dark night, but of night were born bright sky and day, whom she conceived and bore from union and love with shadow. And earth first bore starry heaven or sky, equal to herself to cover her on every side and to be an ever sure abiding place for the blessed gods. So this is interesting. Unlike in previous myths, which as I noted uh, earlier, characteristically begin with water in some form, Hesiod begins his theogony with a divine being who doesn't really have a proper name like Zeus or Tiamat, but is rather representative of a condition, chaos. Also unlike previous myths for which we have evidence, most of the rest of the protagonist's names in this earlier part of the poem that changes as we get into the gods, the, the, uh, the traditional gods, but most of them, uh, are their names are sufficiently transparent to reveal the, the natural character of the process that culminates in the organization of the cosmos. The characters who emerge from chaos are in fact the substances for whom they're named. Arenos is the sky, Gai Gai is the earth, Eros is love and so forth. We might say that in Hesiod's hands, the most primal mythic characters have been transformed from anthropomorphic deities to substances in which the name of the deity is either a material body as with earth and sky or a generalizable principle as with chaos and love. This again signals the coming transition from what, for example, a river or river god would do by virtue of their anger or other personal inclinations to what waters do by virtue of their material nature. So Homer and Hesiod represent the first known stage in Greek thought in the transformation from muthos to logos, although both are still solidly within the sphere of muthos. The next step began to become evident about a century later. Two figures are of particular interest here, Stesichorus, a poet, and Thales, a philosopher. We're now at around 600 BC, or about 100 years after Homer and Hesiod and about 200 years before the death of Socrates. I'm going to fill in the time frame a little long so, so folks don't get too lost in all this chronology. So starting with Stesichorus, he was a popular lyric poet who was regarded by subsequent commentators as something of an innovator. The innovative character of Stesichorus's poetry is evident in several ways, including his use of adjectives. For Homer, you might remember, blood is characteristically black. The laughter of the gods is unquenchable. The sea is unwearying. Dawn, famously, is rosy-fingered. The ways in which these adjectives modify their accompanying nouns in Homer's works are essentially unchanging. In other words, Homer's use of adjectives reflected a paradigmatic mythic ling linguistic structure in which descriptive adjectives became familiar by being stated and repeated as in a chorus or a liturgy. In Stesichorus's poetry, adjectives are more varied, sometimes even when modifying the same noun. A river could be root silver, a child could be bruiseless, and others that we might take as being somewhat more varied or possibly even imaginative than Homer's. And the adjectives can be paired with different nouns, which, doesn't, which very rarely happens in Homeric poetry. In this way and others, Stesichorus's lyrical poetry bears some of the marks of innovation. We know very little about Stesichorus aside from the few fragments of his poems that have survived. We do know, however, that in one of them, he recanted an earlier poem in which he had told how Helen, or as we know her, Helen of Troy, 
had allowed herself to be abducted by the Trojan Prince Paris, which of course is part of the backstory of the Iliad and the Odyssey. The reason that Stesichorus recanted, according to the ancients, was that Helen struck him blind for having written blasphemously about her. Now, how could a beautiful woman strike a poet blind 500 years later? Well, that was because there was a different myth about, uh, about Helen in which she was not a beautiful woman, but a beautiful goddess who never left her ancestral home and didn't do any of the things that are accounted for in the Iliad and the Odyssey. So Stesichorus wrote another poem correcting his slight and recanting the original one. Helen, the goddess, then supposedly restored his eyesight in order to reward him for retracting his blasphemous words. This story was tellingly recounted by Plato some 200 years later in a passage in his dialogue, The Phaedrus. And I'm going to uh, move to this part and show you what Plato has Socrates say to Phaedrus about this very issue. <clears throat> For those who make mistakes in mythology, Socrates tells Phaedrus, there's an old remedy, which Stesichorus was aware of, although Homer was not. When he lost his sight for speaking ill of Helen, Stesichorus, unlike Homer, was enough of an intellectual to understand the cause. He immediately composed the poem, which begins, false is this tale, you never went in a ship to sea, nor saw the towers of Troy. As soon as he had finished what he called his palinode or recantation, he recovered his sight. Now, Plato's interpretation of this well-known episode makes abundantly clear, I believe, how a philosopher retrospectively regarded the myth-preserving Homer and the myth-amending Stesichorus. In Plato's telling, Homer could not find a cure for his legendary blindness because he was not enough of an intellectual to understand what had caused the problem. In other words, he didn't really understand the nature of causation. He wasn't an intellectual. And of course, those who've read the Republic will know that Homer's blindness is pilloried there, his intellectual and moral blindness in many other ways as well. But it's very brief here in the Phaedrus. Um, and we need to think about that uh, perhaps in light of the Republic to see that he's saying even more about uh, that's disparaging about Homer than is implied directly in this passage from the Phaedrus. Stesichorus, on the contrary, according to Plato, was enough of an intellectual to perceive the cause of his affliction and to change it. And this was probably easy for Stesichorus because in the words of the later commentator Dionysus of Halicarnassus, he was, quote, driven by a desire for change. Stesichorus recounted known myths, but he did so on his own terms, presaging the more radical uses of them that would mark the works of the great playwrights, Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides, and the rest, their contemporaries, a couple of centuries later. Stesichorus's innovation therefore represented an important departure from the attempt to preserve ancient myths that marked the works of Homer. I want to be careful again here. Just as the Logos-oriented aspects of Homer and Hesiod should not be overstated, the same is true of Stesichorus. In his own time, he was praised for portraying mythic, mythic characters accurately in accordance with tradition. Although he recanted his original poem about Helen, as Homer presumably would not have done because he was not enough of an intellectual or for whatever reason, he replaced it with one that uses an accepted alternative myth rather than simply inventing a new one. And while he departed from liturgical repetition in his use of adjectives, as I mentioned earlier, he preserved it in other respects, such as repeating long phrases almost verbatim, just as Homer had. Still, Stesichorus's innovations presaged a later era in which departure from the myths as they'd been previously rendered would become increasingly common. Of more importance in the transition from Muthos to Logos was the work of Stesichorus's near contemporary, Thales of Miletus in Asia Minor. Thales was one of the renowned seven sages of Greece who flourished during the first half of the sixth century BC. He was by all accounts a highly intellectual man who inquired into the nature of causation in a way that represented a major departure from Muthos. Based on the testimony of the ancients and on the fragments of his writings that have survived, 
Thales, and this is again around 600 BC, is thought to have believed that the origin of everything in the universe is water. This is obviously a different type of account than that which says that the origins of things is a divine being or substance, as in primarily mythic works, such as those of Homer and Hesiod, or the more paradigmatic myths. Thales was undoubtedly familiar with those works, but as far as we know, excuse me, he never attributed the origin, organization, or control of the cosmos to the ancient gods. From the perspective of subsequent thinkers, Thales was a major innovator, and everything that had preceded him was pre-philosophic. Writing about 250 years later, Aristotle began his investigation of the wisdom of the thinkers who preceded him with Thales, and I want to underline that word wisdom, whom he described as the founder of philosophy. Aristotle explicitly distinguished from Thales from earlier writers who had used, quote, mythical language throughout, unquote. Aristotle recognized the similarity between Thales' claims about water and a myth that appears in Hesiod's Theogony, which associated water with the union of the Titans Oceanus and Tethys, but he regarded that similarity as being trivial. The word philosopher, of course, means lover of wisdom, and Aristotle reserved the term wisdom for those who had, quote, knowledge of certain principles and causes unquote, not those who knew and recited ancient myths. On this basis, of course, Thales was much wiser than Homer or Hesiod. The quest for origins didn't disappear with the decline of Muthos, but it was radically transformed. The earliest philosophers in Greece, later referred to as the pre-Socratics, posited origins such as water for Thales, as I mentioned, air for his countrymen and successor Anaximenes, fire for Heraclitus, and four elements, earth, air, fire, and water for Empedocles, and there are, of course, others. Each of those elements was nominally material, so they vaguely echoed Hesiod's Uranus and Gaia, sky and earth, and the others. But the material characteristics of Hesiod's deities and his constant reference to the gods allowed them to be anthropomorphized. That was much more difficult with the pre-Socratics because they conceived of and explained their foundation material characteristics, not as deities, but as material principles, not just material itself. So not just water for Thales, but the principle of wetness, not just air for Anaximenes, but the principle of dryness and coldness, not just fire for Heraclitus, but the principle of heat, and so on. Each of these elements has obvious flaws as a universal explanatory principle for the natural world, and that led to further attempts to find better explanations. And the search for better explanations is, of course, going to accentuate a logos-oriented rather than a muthos-oriented approach. So the progress of philosophy was undermining muthos through increasingly non-mythic modes of explanation. But it was doing so in other respects as well, and I mentioned this earlier. Some of the clearest evidence was in the work of another pre-Socratic philosopher, Xenophanes of Colophon, who lived about two centuries after Homer and Hesiod, a century after Thales, and a century before Socrates. And at this point, I think we need to have a timeline. So I'll give you some of the folks that I've been talking about here. Homer and Hesiod flourishing about 700 BC, Homer probably a little earlier. Stesichorus and Thales flourishing around, as they would say in the ancient Greek world, around 600 BC, so about 100 years later, and some marked transitions in the direction of Lagos. Xenophanes of Colophon, let's say uh, 75 to 100 years after Stesichorus and Thales, now I'm giving birth and death dates, although they're not, they're not exact, and the further back you go, the, the less clear we are on them. And then Herodotus, the historian who I mentioned, had spoken of Homer and Hesiod giving us our theogonies, right? giving the Greek world its theogonies. Socrates, slightly younger than Herodotus, Plato, roughly a generation younger, and Aristotle, a generation younger than that. So we're going from, with Homer, maybe 725 BC to Aristotle, roughly 400 years later. That's the basic time frame of what I'm speaking about here. And we'll add to this as we go along. As I mentioned earlier, Homer's gods and goddesses 
were often duplicitous and divided among themselves, and humans worshiped them not because they were particularly wise, certainly not because they were moral, but because they were powerful. Xenophanes was the first known writer to expressly use those facts to make a direct case against Muthos. As he stated, Homer and Hesiod say that the gods do all manner of things which men would consider disgraceful, adultery, stealing, deceiving each other. In contrast to this, Xenophanes wrote, it is not right to put strength ahead of wisdom, which is good. So again, wisdom is no longer the wisdom of myth telling. In fact, that's not wise at all. These, these gods, according to the, the people who tell myths, are gods of strength, but strength shouldn't be put ahead of wisdom. I presume that means morally, because wisdom is good. So those statements of Xenophanes, and the, again, we only have fragments, anticipate the much more developed critique that's made repeatedly by Socrates and Plato's works, namely that a true God could not be unjust or immoral or have any of the other less savory traits that were characteristic of the mythical gods and goddesses. Such a God could not be considered, or goddess couldn't be considered good, and to Xenophanes, Socrates, and the rest of the emerging philosophic crew, a wicked god was a contradiction in terms. The decline of Muthos, in a practical sense, came about gradually. Throughout the centuries, the daily lives of Greek people continued to involve regular acts of devotion toward the gods. The myths inspired epic, epic poetry, tragedy, comedy, and the plastic arts. But in the hands of the Greek intelligentsia, myth was becoming increasingly demythified. The plays of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and their contemporaries invoked versions of the ancient myths, but those plays were more about artistic invention than remembrance in the mythic tradition. For example, Aeschylus employed the well-known stories of the house of Atreus to extol Athenian democracy and to give credit uh, for it to the goddess Athena, this in his trilogy, the Oresteia. While Athenians undoubtedly, Athens undeniably got its name from Athena, that fact long predated its status as a democracy. More importantly, Aeschylus's account in the Oresteia differed greatly from the standard myth in which Athena defeated the sea god Poseidon in a, sea, in a set contest to determine which of them would become the patron of the city. The other fifth century BC Greek playwrights revised and embellished the ancient myths in similar ways hoping to satisfy an audience that no longer literally believed in the myths, even though they continued to believe in the gods. And the implicit definition of muthos was further secularized by Aristotle, who referred to the plots of those plays, in fact, of all plays, as muthoi. The continuing decline of myth was becoming evident in other disciplines as well as philosophy. For example, historia, history. Herodotus begins his history of the Persian Wars by stating that his main purpose was to preserve the memory and greatness of the exploits of the Greeks and barbarians. This goal bears some vague relationship to myth in that it preserves memories of the great ones and provides models for behavior. But Herodotus lays far more emphasis on the roles of men than of gods at times even rebutting myths, such as those in Homer's works, in light of logic and empirical evidence. The historian's declining regard for the veracity of myth became even more pronounced in the work of his successor, Thucydides, for whom the only significant motivations for human action had nothing at all to do with the gods. And now to update that timeline to include others, Homer and Hesiod around 700 BC, Stesichorus and Thales around 600, Xenophanes close to a century later. And then we're getting the fifth, fifth century uh, writers, thinkers that I've um, referred to. Um, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, the great playwrights, Herodotus, historian, Thucydides a generation later, Socrates, all these fifth century and of a piece in terms of the move from Muthos to Logos, broadly speaking. The development of non-paradigmatic forms of myth took a fresh turn in the works of Plato, who often employed myths in his dialogues, most of them told by Socrates. 
Those myths bear only a superficial resemblance to the ones told by Homer and Hesiod, let alone those of ancient Near Eastern civilizations such as Babylonia. The poets and playwrights of Socrates' time transformed known, known myths to suit their purposes, as I just mentioned, Aeschylus did that in the Oristia. Plato's myths went a step further. They were almost entirely constructed using little, if any, of the material of pre-existing myths. This is hardly surprising since Plato's primary commitment was to Lagos rather than Muthos. His myths, unlike those that had preceded him, were not intended as absolute truths, but as parables and likely stories whose main purpose was to encourage ethical behavior on the part of his listeners. For example, he has Socrates conclude his account of the afterlife in the Phaedo by saying, quote, no sensible person would insist that these things are as I have described them, unquote, but that a sensible person would embrace something like this account because it will, quote, adorn his soul with moderation, righteousness, courage, freedom, and truth. Plato's attitude toward muthos in the contemporary, in the, in the classic sense, is typified by an exchange with Phaedrus. This is not Phaedo, Phaedrus, a different dialogue, which I mentioned earlier in discussing Plato's attitude toward Stesichorus and Homer. At one point, Phaedrus asked Socrates, isn't there a muthos that Boreas abducted Orithea from somewhere here on the banks of the Eleusis? That's where Socrates and Phaedrus are walking at the time. This is Boreas apparently in pursuit of Orithea on an ancient vase. Socrates replies, so they say after which Phaedrus asks him if he believes that muthos. Socrates responds that he couldn't answer that question without undertaking a thorough investigation of the matter, which would then lead him to have to examine a number of related issues. Here, Socrates indirectly, but clearly, affirms that he regards the question of belief, including belief in the traditional myths, as properly being the product of rational inquiry rather than uncritical acceptance. Plato's dialogues are not entirely detached from Muthos in a more traditional sense. Unlike almost every subsequent philosopher, Plato appreciates the importance of remembering. This is evident in his so-called theory of recollection, which posits that knowledge is latent in human beings and can be retrieved by the philosophically oriented soul. While this conception of the vital significance of memory is quite different from that of classic myth, it does preserve one of its most important aspects in a way that most subsequent philosophers do not. And, and Plato evidently believed that myth contains important elements of truth, perhaps those for which philosophy as logos is not equipped to, to account for. Still, just as Homer's works primarily reflect the mythic mentality, Plato's primarily reflect the philosophic one. This is a distinction with a great deal of difference. And it was well expressed by the late Cameroonian philosopher, Marcian Toa, who wrote this. I hope it can be read from where you are. Between the mythical mentality and critical thought, in other words, between muthos consciousness and logos consciousness, the distance is considerable so that the same spirit cannot participate at the same time with one and the same questions to adhere to the mythical representation of the absolute and at the same time, think it critically. For the mythical mentality, the truth is not to be discovered by personal reflection, but is something received, a gift of the gods and or ancestors. Unquote. Plato's myths are philosophical insofar as they, and then back to Toa's direct words, are created in a spirit freed from the grip of myth, unquote, in order to preserve a revised form of myth and, quote, make it more favorable to the philosophic enterprise. And so it seems fitting to conclude this account of the transition from Muthos to Logos in the ancient Greek world with Plato. Um, I also mentioned briefly that um, similar traditions arose about the same time in every then existing civilization for which we have records. Um, for example, it's in the middle of this period that Confucianism and Taoism arise in China. And there's a lot more to be said about this but we don't have the time and I'm not really the person to be talking about this. But although we've highlighted ancient Greek thought, a very similar transition appears to have been going on uh, various places around the world. So um, after the time of Aristotle, there became a um, further investigation into myth. What could myth tell us now? 
and now could be anywhere from 300 BC to yesterday. Um, there's lots more I could say about this, but I do need to be bringing this to a close. So I will mention that for the Stoics, um, myths weren't literally true, but they were they revealed naturalistic and moral truths. The Epicureans of the same time thought they were just fabrications that bolstered the authority of the religious and political hierarchy. And uh, the most famous exposition of that is in the work of Lucretius, the first century BC Roman writer who wrote this about religion, but, but also about referring to myth. For think of the endless fantasies your, fantasies your priests devise that can subvert all reason thought and turn your life to terror and confusion. Of course, for if men saw all their troubles must one day end, which the Epicureans believed that with ashes to ashes, dust to dust, somehow they'd find the strength to stand against the Hierophant and his threats. So this was all just uh, uh, myths and religion generally were all part of a big conspiracy um, to have people quaking in fear. The Stoics and the Epicureans both professed belief in the gods, but the Stoics believed the gods were vitally involved in human affairs, while the Epicureans thought they didn't concern themselves with such lowly matters. But both of them were primarily philosophic, agreeing that the ancient myths were not to be taken literally. Um, so with the Christian era, of course, this changes again. Um, the, there are stories that are the authorized ones. The other ones are not to be interpreted allegorically. Uh, by the time of the uh, European Renaissance, the world is again safe for, um, for uh, Greek humanism and Roman humanism. So you could have Virgil uh, allegorically in the poem, The Divine Comedy, protecting Dante as he moves towards salvation. But the pagans uh, start to disappear as you move further uh, up. In the Enlightenment, myth again becomes um, basically the way we see it now, as I explained at the beginning of what I spoke. Um, that, uh, but for them, ancient myth and contemporary religion for folks like Voltaire and Benjamin Franklin um, had become equally untrustworthy. They were deists, they believed there must be a God watchmaker or something. Um, and so then um, a lot more has happened since then. Um, interest in myth comes and goes, but uh, so we could be talking here about the German philosophers Hegel and Nietzsche, who both thought there was some kind of need for reestablishing myth to get things uh, foundationally sorted in human beings' minds. Um, there are mythic stories that survive to now, the legend of William Tell, which is still held among the Swiss, uh, many of whom believe that Tell actually existed, although there's no evidence of that. Um, more that I would have liked to say, but have run out of time, on uh, Dr. Ernst Kassir and his uh, brilliant student, Suzanne Langer, whose works talk about the importance of myth. And, um, and the notion that myth is still relevant in modern time has other notable adherents. Joseph Campbell believed that myth contains all the wisdom we need for our deepest fulfillment. The British writer and theologian C.S. Lewis also regarded myth as the key to human fulfillment. But contrary to Campbell, Lewis believed that Christianity represented the fulfillment of the history of myth that Christianity is, quote, the myth that was true, unquote. Both of these men thought that myths reflected our deepest desires, but their conclusions were as different as those of the Stoics and their early Christians, who had entirely different orientations toward the scriptural accounts. And so, several millennia after most paradigmatic forms of myth have been discarded, the significance of myth continues to be a topic of serious discussion, sometimes even among philosophers. You know, it might always be that way. Myth is part of the foundational fabric of every known culture. And it could be that it points to that which endures, regardless of the slings and arrows of time. In the immortal words that Shakespeare put into the mouth of Hamlet, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Thank you for listening. Thank you, David. Um, I'm taking in this this picture here from Hamlet. That's quite something. Um, we have um, uh, uh, a number of questions. Uh, 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 to be specific, we have nine questions. 
in 15 minutes. So uh, let's begin. Uh, the first question comes from Frederick Sanford, who asks, is there a PDF of the book list of Shimer College? <laughs> Is there a PDF of the, I'm sure there is. And uh, if we can get Frederick's uh, email address or whatever, I'm happy to send it. All righty. So Frederick, you heard it. Um, Stoic Dan asks, uh, uh, what are some famous Greek myths and how did they shape Greek culture? And I must say this was sent in, uh, 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 you know, early on the lecture uh, before you uh, mentioned some, but um, in respect to the question, I'll let you uh, uh, fill in the blanks. Well, you know the 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 classic Greek myths um, are pretty well well known. Um, it depends who you read for what kind of account you want of these. I mean, if you're thinking of naming the myths, um, they're they're you know they're myths that are. Uh, if you want to look at the origins, you know the origin of of uh, Oranos to Kronos to Zeus and so forth. If you read Hesiod's Theogony, you get a lot of what you would find in say Edith Hamilton or Bullfinch or something about that. Um, if you're looking at specific myths of, um, of, of, um, godly adventures and so forth, or, you know, there are these, the, the myths of the, the fall, the house of Adrius, Atreus, the fall of Cadmus, the house of Cadmus. And these, um, were well known for, you know, for, not for, for centuries. Um, we don't know exactly the origins of them. And someone like Robert Graves will explain that well, he'll he'll kind of give you some sense of the evidence of how how um, um, clear this myth was in terms of what it said because a lot of them aren't particularly linear. We kind of have to put together this fragment and that fragment and say, well, this must have happened in between something like that. So um, so that has to do, I think, with the veracity of the myths. But certainly by the time of the fifth century, it's like. The myth becomes a unified story. You can tell that um, that you can also mold in different directions, as Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides did. Um, but uh, certainly, these these uh, stories about the about Ares, Athena, and you know the, the sort of what the gods had done were pretty foundational for the Greeks. And it'd be hard for me to pick out a couple and say these are the most the most significant. Um, but I think think we have a pretty good record of the uh, origins of, of the Greek myths that survived and were foundational for the beliefs of the, of the culture. Um, although that the level of belief, as I mentioned, changed over the centuries. Um, thanks, David. Um, the, uh, and thanks, Stoic Dan. The third question comes from Steve Barrett, who asks, can you give us religious holders of myths some confidence? On the one hand, we put up with the fundamentalists who think they are literal fact, on the other hand, we have the modernists who attack our beliefs as mere myths. Yeah, so <laughs> that's a great, great question, Steve. Um, okay, so the in in the literature, when when modern day theologians and philosophers of religion talk or talk about myth. There's a variety of orientations, depending what they think myth is and what it, what kind of what baggage it carries, in terms of what role they play in myth. For example, in religion, right? So, a fundamentalist, um, I would I would understand, would not recall, would would not consider, let's say, the first book of Gen the creation account in the first book of Genesis as a myth, and that would largely be, I would say, not quite definitional. It would be more of a sense of myth is the way we regard the pagan stories that have been discredited. Like when, um, uh, when, when St. Paul says later to the followers, um, don't, let the, don't let these people believe these uh, silly stories told by, I mean, he's basically talking about, the, about ancient myths there. Um, but, but some say, well, you know, a myth is this kind of a story and the Genesis story, for example, and the other subsequent story fulfill that definition. Um, and that's what C.S. Lewis believed, that in fact, these myths were part of a, a religious structure and the Christian ones happened to be true, right? That, that, that this was the case. Um, that doesn't by itself get to the question of the literal aspects of it. 
because it is part of mythic consciousness, I would say, as I've outlined it here, I think Steve's got it to an important point of that, that it is, in a sense, fundamental, right? That you actually believe the myth to be literally true. So, um, you know, the world was created, you know, God created the world in six days and so forth. That's the myth. And if you are really in mythic consciousness about the Hebrew scripture, that is, in fact, what you'll believe. Um, the move toward allegorical understanding uh, is definitely pretty strong in some early Christian writers. It's pretty strong in Augustine, who um, seems pretty, I would say, relatively liberal for 400 AD in terms of saying that the truths of these are often allegorical. I mean, that's a lot of what he does in his, in his writing. Um, they're literal too. Um, so uh, some of the issue here, uh, I would say, in the lines, the religious lines, let's say the lines of Christianity as we have it now from a quite liberal Christianity, which I would say largely uh, is not um, literalist. I mean, literalist in some ways, but not, not thoroughly. Um, maybe regards Jesus as a great teacher who in the Sermon on the Mount and so forth um, goes to uh, the I would say more muthos oriented, it's a little hard to translate that to the present day, notion that these are all literally true stories and um, that the lessons we draw from them are, um, are not really open to interpretation. I mean, you don't, you don't do a, a midrash on, on the Bible for a fundamentalist, right? So I think that's the best I can do, but Steve, I'll see you on Tuesday and maybe we can talk more about this. <laughs> Um, thanks, uh, Steve, for your question, and uh, uh, David. Uh, because of the way you ended that answer, David, I'm actually going to skip down the queue to a question uh, that uh, connects with uh, what you just said, um, which is uh, from uh, our fellow instructor, uh, Cynthia Rutz, who asks, um, contra Marcian Tawa's idea of the distance between myth and critical thought, colon, how would you characterize the Jewish commentaries on Torah? Uh, 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 and then uh, seems like critical thought applied to myth, question mark. Yeah, that's really, thank you, Cindy. That's a really uh, interesting point. I This is kind of when I was talking about Midrash and so forth. I mean, the, the commentaries, I think, are, um, are, are indications of departure from, uh, from, from Muthos, I would say. Um, they, are, they take, they take the, the stories seriously um, obviously, I mean, that's, that's the, their primary, but the question of what they mean, right? Um, now, this isn't quite Lagos either. I think it's more Lagos oriented, but I'm not aware of uh, Midrash, and this is, could be my, my ignorance, of, of these commentaries. And there's some, there's some story of, let's say, Philo versus Moses Maimonides or something, giving different accounts of the meanings of these things. But, but generally speaking, the commentary is not intrinsically the search for better explanations in the sense that we're going to reject the theory that the, the universe is water and say it's four elements, not just one. It's, it's, it's how, is, um, how is meaning best drawn out? And maybe it could be drawn out 80% in this way and 65% in that way. And the, the things come out in these commentaries that are um, very helpful in understanding. Um, but the very notion that understanding is needed, right, that you need this kind of commentary to understand is already a departure from, um, from muthos in the most uh, traditional sense, I would say. Thanks, David. Uh, the next question comes uh, from Barbara Reynolds. Uh, why do you think this transformation to believing in one's own logic uh, happened? Yeah, I don't think it's particularly um, one's own logic. I don't, I don't see it as individualistic, but the transition to, to rational thinking, um, I think there, there are a few, a few reasons for it. I, I kind of looked at the, the way you might look at it in the historian of, of ideas way, not in terms of uh, social interactions with other cultures and so forth, but just that when you start writing them down, right, you're going to start generating problems that didn't exist before. So that's kind of what I talked about in talking about Homer and Hesiod and then later Stesichorus and so forth. And then folks like Thales coming along and saying, you know, none of this really sounds like a very good explanation to me. Um, 
so so but the but the notion of credibility i think uh has other roots that are more matters of social history um you you get the the even the encounter itself between the greeks and the trojans even though homer doesn't really distinguish between them in terms of intelligence or valor or anything else other than superior numbers and who eventually wins um gets you uh to a kind of an awareness that things could be otherwise. And really any kind of tribal situation or the muthos is perfect for a closed society. It's perfect, right? It tells everything. There's no contrary stories. They could theoretically arise, but they're not likely to. But the stranger visits the village and says, huh, with us, we do this. And people start thinking, you know, there's, there are just ways in which this works. And you get a lot of the struggles of this in, for example, in Herodotus, this is great because he talks about the Greeks and the barbarians. He tends a lot of time with the beliefs of other cultures. Sometimes he says, and they have one we could adopt here. And you know, and so, so by then, which is of course much later, this whole notion of accepting a muthos on face value is just gone. I mean, that's just not gonna happen anymore. Um, you know, you'd have to be living in a cave basically and uh, very few people are. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, David. Thank you for your question, Barbara. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Ray Lucchese, and Ray asks, uh, and also there's a comment uh, uh, by Jeffrey Doherty at the end. Uh, Ray asks, I've always thought of Homer's epics as something more of a, of a means or mode of transferring real knowledge about military technologies, real personality and real emotion from history and tradition to the present. This was uh, pre-written times, uh, pre 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 literacy and beside uh, and besides uh, parent to children how was technology able to be transmitted over generations without being horribly uh, mutated beyond anything in the original by having an epic that discusses these things uh, and he means an oral uh, epic uh, they can be supplied across generations with more fidelity just speculation here the dramatical actions colliding forces aspect of them makes it more memorable. I suppose any other forms of technology transfer would have fallen over time, and the uh, muthos, dramatic telling of a story, became the only solution able to transfer such knowledge correctly over many generations. These earlier forms may not have survived to the time of writing. I would say since the advent of writing, the need for epics to be used to transfer information is less of a concern. The dramatic uh, the dramatic actions, forces, and collision of forces continues even today in fiction. And that was Ray's uh, uh, comment uh, uh, and question, and uh, to which uh, Jeffrey Doherty added, um, I like this idea of bards as our uh, data pipelines. Oh, are you... see, David, you are muted, you say. How did that happen? Um, let me take the spotlight off. Da, 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 da. Bear with me, everyone. Where did David's little square go? Here, David, I'm asking you to unmute. That should work. Okay. There we go. Um, you know, Ray and Jeffrey, I have to apologize profusely, but I realized I had suddenly gotten muted and was trying to unmute. And I heard some of what was said, and I know it was fairly long. So I, um, it sounded, you know, it sounded very interesting in terms of the transmit, you know, the transmission of information and so forth. Um, but I didn't pick up enough of it to be able to answer intelligently. So I apologize. And Kendall, I don't know if you want to ask that again, or if we want to move on. I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, well, let me see here. Uh, you know, I was. Uh, 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 there's not really a question mark. Uh, so the. Uh, oh, okay. Well, maybe uh, it can just be a contribution. <laughs> yeah. So That's I think funny. Ray's Ray's making a point though that like before writing, um, uh, 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 epic needed to do more jobs. Yeah. Than what we categorize as literature uh, mm -hmm. or myth, uh, right. and so that there would be real, as it were, information. Right. Right. I mean, the, the the myths do an immense amount of heavy lifting. Right. The culture, in some sense, is at some level on paradigmatic myths, it's entirely dependent on the myth. It's got to do all those things. That's very true. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Ray and Jeffrey. Um, let's see, the final question that we'll have time for is from uh, Jerry Ree, who asks, would you argue that from Muthos to Logos is a prescription for Palinode? I mean, Logos is this. It is not that, namely Muthos. It is not what it used to be. That is a very, very fine question. Um, so is it a, 
recipe for palinode. Um, you know, I mean, historically, <laughs> this is what's happened in the history of philosophy. So in some, some sense, I guess that's true, right? I mean, that, that there's this constant reevaluation. And, you know, uh, even though I wasn't able to talk much, much about the history of, of the idea of myth as it evolved through different uh, eras, um, the, the notion that whatever the truth was needs to be re-examined regularly, which you of course already see in the works of Plato, it gets more stable in the works of Aristotle, I think, and others, um, becomes um, just what, in a sense, what the Lagos does, right? I mean, you have these, these uh, great efforts by folks like Descartes to say, here's the final truth about this, right? I mean, this goes throughout history, Aquinas, you can pick anyone. And even contemporary philosophers like, well, you know, we'll do this, although they're much more circumspect. Um, but, but then there's also like, no, I don't think they got this wrong, right? The, 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 um, the attempt at better explanation. And when you add empirical evidence to this, right, then it's not, we're not talking pure speculative philosophy here, right? We're talking about things that say, well, we used to believe this and we talk in these ways, but now that we know more about, you know, gender differences or similarities or differences and similarities between humans and animals or all, that these all bear on issues so that, you know, you add in effect the scientific method, you could say, to logos, which is closely related to it anyway. Um, and you get, I guess you could say, <laughs> endless palinodes to a more progressive understanding of truth, which in fact can never be unquestioned and in, is, is uh, turns out to be almost the uh, exact opposite of of Muthos. Well, already, um, thank you very much, David, and thank you uh, for everyone who submitted questions and apologies to the uh, three or four questions that we uh, 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 don't have time uh, to hear uh, David uh, respond to. Um, I am going to uh, take you guys off of mute so that you can um, hang on here, cancel that, um, so that you can applaud David. Uh, ask all to unmute. There we are. So let David hear the applause. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Uh, and um, I must say that it's great to see a number of names uh, from our year one students, uh, folks that we haven't seen uh, at these uh, lectures in the past. So, um, all right, everybody, have a great weekend. And I hope to see you next month, uh, December 1. Farewell. Thank you. So long. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you. All right, here we go.